Uh, my name is Heather Miller. I'm a PhD student at EPFL, and I work with Martin Odersky on scholar-related stuff. Um, I am also, at, at the moment, at working with Databricks. Uh, does anybody know Databricks and Spark? Do you think it's cool? I think it's cool. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm currently with them, uh, and actually some of this stuff that I'm going to talk about, uh, this function passing stuff, uh, is sort of a research project that I'm doing part of my time when I'm there. Um, but uh, I want to first say that sort of what I've been doing for majority of my PhD at this point has been sort of trying to um, provide language support for distributed system builders. So, um, you know, I've, I've started with things like serialization. Uh, so we made a serialization framework that does stuff at compile time, so it's more performant than runtime-based serialization frameworks. Uh, and at the same time, it's flexible. You can add a bunch of serialization. For, uh, you can change the way data, your data is represented. Uh, and that whole idea there is to be a little bit flexible in how you exchange messages between, or data between machines. Uh, and then most recently, uh, uh, I've, I worked on something called Spores. It has a funny name. Um, but the idea is basically to have um, some sort of notion of a function or a, cl a function closure that you can serialize and send over the wire and you can send back and forth all over the place if you feel like it. Uh, and this is actually uh, a pretty, well, not a super involved problem, but more involved than you might expect. Um, you can actually do all kinds of stuff like use type signatures to control how or what, what closures capture and things like this so you can actually in, in APIs decide what, your, what users who pass functions to you might actually capture and send over the wire or something like this. Uh, so these are two sort of projects that I've worked on and actually what I'm going to talk about today um, is sort of it builds on the basis of these serializable functions. So, um, and, and the idea and the goal sort of, of, of this whole work is to, to try and provide some sort of substrate that one can build a distributed system upon uh, and, and sort of make things a little bit easier by design. Um, and actually, uh, one nice sort of side effect, or not well, side effect, but one result of, of <laughs> actually side effects aren't so horrible sometimes, but okay, you need to do logging, um, <laughs> especially in a distributed system. I hope that you know, if you're writing a functional distributed system that you're doing some kind of logging because it's otherwise a bad idea. But um, so what I'd like to sort of show you at the end of all of this is that um, by design, uh, if you do things a little bit more functionally, you keep things stateless, and you, you pass functions around to do transformations, um, then you know, things like fault tolerance, keeping stuff in memory, and then also even debugging if you have types around, uh, you know, get a little bit better, a little bit nicer. Uh, and like I said, in a nice, a nice functional way that's, that's, that's stateless, as I'll show you. Um, but I also want to point out that this is currently like a research project. Uh, it's something that we're just experimenting with. We have no idea if it's a great idea, a horrible idea, if it's going to work out, if it's like really inflexible, if it's too flexible. We're currently experimenting with it. Um, so all of this stuff that I'm going to talk to you about, uh, this is all under development and you know, can fluctuate. And uh, we're working on, on actually like trying to write it up for, for, for a conference in the next month or two. And again, I have to say thanks to Databricks because they're letting me do this with them and uh, on, on, on Spark, basically, I'm playing with Spark to, do, to, to realize some of these things. Um, and OK, if you walk away with anything, you should walk away with this one fundamental idea, and that is that um, this whole function passing model thing is basically a duel to, to like message passing via actors. Um, it's, it's actually, the cool thing is that it's, it's a complement. It's, it's, it's a dual. It kind of just is the inverse. Uh, so OK, how is it, how is it a, a complement, a dual, or whatever? So the idea is, in actor systems, I mean, the T, T, T L, D, R, whatever, the, 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 short, the short sort of description of, of, of what actor frameworks kind of do, uh, they, actors encapsulate state and behavior. So you have a message handler that sort of dictates the stuff that you want to do to data that you receive. And an actor stays on one machine. It doesn't move around. It gets instantiated somewhere, and it should never go anywhere else. And that's very good, actually. You should never want to move your actor anywhere. Um, and, and sort of the, 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 the big observation is that actors exchange data. Uh, through asynchronous messaging in a concurrent way, right? Um, but they, they, they keep their, their behavior, their message handler in one place, and they pass their data around. Uh, so the function passing stuff, uh, the idea behind this is that you have a stateless, like a stateless thing that is passing the functions around. So it's, it's basically you keep your data uh, like represented in persistent data structures. Uh, you keep it stationary, and you pass the functions around through asynchronous messaging. 
Um, so we don't want to move data. You don't need to serialize data. Don't serialize a little, little code pointer to some functionality that you want to do to that data. Um, and I think uh, if I want you all to have the right idea that this is a model for programming with data, not like some new concurrent process. Um, I'm not trying to replace a concurrent process like actors. Instead, we're just providing a new way or a new means of working with distributed data in a, in a more functional way. So like that's should keep that in mind. Um, has anybody does it, has anybody read this by the way this paper? It's a good one, right? Like this is from 1994, um, and and so. To go back to this point here about you know, providing a new way to, to work with distributed data, whenever you try to develop some new framework for working with distributed objects, um, you have to kind of be careful of a number of pitfalls that, that distributed framework builders, or I'm sorry, not framework builders, but people who try to operate on distributed objects wind up falling into, and well, we keep falling into it for now more than 20 years. Um, <laughs> as this paper sort of, it, it's, it's timeless. It still describes a lot of mistakes that we currently make, and sort of the big mistake that we currently, that, that, that system, uh, well, that people who, who build some frameworks for, for distributed sort of object passing and whatever, um, what we often do is we kind of mess up this notion of transparency. I'm just going to quote the paper uh, and explain what I mean. So sort of the, the, the key things that make something a distributed system, latency, like you know, memory being in different address spaces, partial failure, and concurrency, make sort of the merging of different computational models, like local and a remote sort of you know, objects, uh, you know, unwise, and they just, it just doesn't work. I, th I mean, you, I can, if you read the paper, there's plenty, I'm not going to name anything by name, but there are plenty of, 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 of systems and, 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 and protocols and whatnot that they cite that didn't really do, do the job the best they could because they ended up being transparent or trying to be transparent. Instead, what they say a better, is a better approach is to accept that there are irreconcilable differences between local and distributing, uh, distributed computing and that uh, one should be conscious of those differences at all stages of the design and implementation of a distributed application. That means that somebody, like, you know, if you have a whole, like, like you know, sandwich of, of different users who are trying to build something that should be talking to different machines, all users should be aware of latency. All users should be aware of, of communication and some of these things. You should not try to be transparent. Um, so rather than trying to merge local and remote objects, engineers need to constantly be reminded of the differences between the two and know when it is appropriate to use each kind of object. Uh, and this works in actor systems, right? Um, and we, you know, try to make sort of the same decisions here. Keep, keep uh, communication explicit so that people can deal with things like latency or failure in a very explicit way, right? Because the idea is that you want to build something on top of one of these frameworks. Okay, so that's sort of the motivation uh, behind, or some of the design decisions or sort of the, the goals w we, we had when we started this. Uh, what does it look like? Um, so there are two... Whoops, two concepts, right? I, I think I've already kind of mentioned them. Uh, one, keep your data stationary and immutable. Two, you have portable functions that you move around. You move those to the data. Um, and uh, so we have this one thing called a spore. Um, excellent name, right? So I have to come up with an, another great name. Actually, if anybody has a better idea, please tell me. But uh, we, right now, we're just referring to these containers that hold this immutable data, these data stores as silos for now. Uh, until we can think of something better, uh, and we have these spores. And the idea is that, that this whole model is based on like you know passing spores between these container silo things, which hold the data or or, or, or uh, encapsulate the data basically. So let's first look at maybe what these these silo things are. Um, kind of like a an actor, you they come in two parts. You have the thing itself that holds the data, the thing on the right. Uh, it's parameterized on the data that it should be encaps or holding. Uh, and on the left, you have this thing called a silo ref, and it has uh, well two important methods. Uh, and you know, much like an actor system, you have a reference that you should be dealing with locally that points to this thing that should be uh, on some other machine. And this handle, this this reference, is sort of like the workhorse where you do all of the work on your distributed data, basically. Uh, or you, you basically queue up operations and things, and you use this to kind of like asynchronously control what gets applied to your, your data. So the first uh, sort of important method uh, is, is an apply method, right? So I want to I apply a function to my data. There are two functions here, these four things, um, and, and the, this, the apply method returns another uh, silo ref. Uh, so, well, why is that? Um, so the reason for two spores is that uh, if you're going to be building a framework on top of, of something like this, some sort of function messaging kind of framework, uh, you want to be able to insert your sort of or rather your framework logic uh, 
in somehow, right? And so the, 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 the combinator, like a map on a distributed collections, would be one of those two spores, and the other would be the one that your user passes you, um, if, if there is one. Um, and uh, this is, I should, you know, very important to notice that this thing, that this apply thing is actually lazy. Uh, what it does is it returns this silo ref thing. So it basically just figures out everything that it needs to do to your re remote piece of data. It has its functions, it has kind of how to get to it to on some other machine. Uh, and it returns another reference which represents the result on some other remote machine whenever that thing actually gets computed. Uh, so when that thing is later material, when, when the, re the, the result silo thing, the result piece of data, is materialized somewhere else, uh, you have a reference to it whenever it's, it's, it's ready. Uh, and then the other thing is, is ascend. So does anybody know what views are? I don't know if you like Scala or no Scala or, or not. Um, and this is also in a lot of other languages, but we call them views. Uh, basically, the idea is that you, know, you, you do a bunch of like, lazy operations, and then eventually, when you're ready to, to, to do the computation, you can force it. So you can get rid of intermediate data structures and whatnot. And so um, the reason why there's an apply and ascend is, is, is to have sort of, uh, uh, to be able to have like a, 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 a view-like abstraction over this distributed thing, right? So the send is what is basically equivalent to a, a force. Uh, so I, I would then, you know, do some operations on my piece of data, and I may, maybe I have, I end up with a few of these silo refs, you know, uh, like a chain of them. And then, uh, okay, I want the result back now, so I, I actually say, okay, framework, send all those functions that represent you know, operations to the data, do it, and then give me the result. And so the future uh, is what you know, asynchronously waits for, well, you know, is asynchronously computed, I should say. Uh, so so this, is, this is completed with the result that's returned from um, the, the uh, you know, this chain of operations that you set forth. So, there, so it's important to note that this thing is eager. It, sends, it actually sends all of that information that you, you collected and you, you keep in these silo refs to the, the remote data. And it, you know, in an asynchronous, non-blocking kind of way, it returns the result to the local machine via future. OK. Um, so let's just look at it in picture form. <laughs> so if you have this, this silo ref thing of T and the silo thing of T, and you know how your silo ref knows how to get to or how to deliver something to your to your silo. Um, uh, basically, the way that this works is well, uh, it sends some function. This could represent a function from T to S over the over the wire to your to your piece of data. Uh, and in the eager case, it applies. Well, it this is <laughs> in time step here. It would apply it right. You wind up with a a, uh, like I mentioned, this silo ref that represents the transform data that you know comes out of this fun this function application, and then you know whenever this this piece of data is is materialized, uh, your silo ref gets completed and pointed. To, I'm sorry, ends up pointing directly to that piece of data, and it's just kind of like actors when you're waiting for a new actor to be spawned up or something. You can still send messages to this this thing or use this thing in some way, uh, and, and, and the runtime just kind of queues messages and stuff, so nothing gets lost. Um, but sort of this is the, the, the really basic idea of how, how sort of you apply a function to a piece of data and then what happens, what you, how you get the result. Uh, and also important to note, um, these silo things uh, aren't necessarily meant to be like some huge piece of data that, you know, like there's only one on one machine. Um, there can be several on one machine or several different kinds of them throughout uh, a, a cluster of different machines. Um, it's, it's similar to actors in that sense. They can, they can hold something tiny or huge. It's up to you to decide. Um, and, and so that's kind of where we put the data. Um, I'm going to give you a little kind of like rundown on, on what these spore things are um, uh, without getting into way too much detail. Um, this is sort of what they look like in a basic way. This is also... Uh, at the bottom of the screen, there's a, a, an improvement, a Scala improvement proposal. So you want to get into more details. There's a lot more details that you could look up, look at. Um, but this is the like the longhand form. So um, what is a spore? It's supposed to be a function, right? Um, but the idea is that the spore, uh, a spore, is a function and an environment, and it basically forces you to be explicit with your environment. And so um, your environment's actually. Uh, uh, represented by this thing called the spore header. So this is syntactic, basically. What it does is it forces you, it, it just doesn't compile if you don't actually put the environment that you end up referring to inside of your function 
in the header, right? Um, and this is, like I said, this is the longhand form. There, there's, you can, there's like a literal form for writing these things, but this is sort of how it looks uh, at, in a macroscopic sense. So there's this four header thing at the top. I don't know if there's a, oops, nope. And then this, this, this function in here, uh, this, this int to whatever val result print line, blah, blah, blah. This is the, the actual closure. And everything inside of that closure uh, can only refer to the environment. If it refers to anything else, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't it, doesn't, it doesn't compile. You can't, you can't serialize it, basically. Um, unless it's a, a top level object that's publicly accessible on every machine. That's an exception. <laughs> Um, so, uh, if you're wondering about the relationship between spores and closures, um, so, uh, well, I'm sorry, spore guarantees, I should talk first, the next slide is what the, the relationship. Um, so everything that's captured uh, is declared in this spore header, which means that the initializers for all of those things are called when the, thing, when the spore is created. So uh, that means that whatever you capture cannot change over the execution of anything. It's, it's basically effectively immutable. It like, freezes the environment as it is. And it basically, you know, you, you, you ha it doesn't change over time. Um, and the relationship between spores and closures, uh, actually, they have the exact same evaluation semantics. So if I go back, sorry, you can't really see that. Uh, if, if I just remove this, this, this spore header thing here, this, this block, um, the evaluation semantics are exactly the same. Like, there's, there's no, I don't, I don't change how, how things get evaluated. Whoops. Um, and they're also related because you can, you can write full function literals, and so long as, as that function literal, um, uh, like, you know, ab abides by this, the rules for it to be a spore, uh, you can pass this to something that would expect a spore, like something that you would, you know, have some, some, some method in an API that would expect a function, and maybe the, the framework author wants it to be a spore. It would basically do an implicit conversion, turn the thing into a spore, then check the spore rules to make sure that, okay, this thing, this thing does what it's supposed to do. It doesn't have some crazy environment that it tries to pull in. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that, so, so you can convert, basically, between uh, normal function literals and spores. Um, so if you walk away with anything about spores, what you should keep in mind is basically that uh, it's, they've got two huge benefits. One is that the environment is, ex is declared explicitly, and it's, it's, it's basically immutable. It's fixed at, at the time that uh, the, the thing is, is created, the, the spore is created. And we can then also statically ensure that everything that is captured is, is serializable with this, this serialization framework. Um, and I mean, there's, there's uh, like, if you want to know more, there's a, a paper about it. But there's also, which is a lot nicer to read than a paper, is this, this Scala improvement document. The paper actually includes a, an interesting little type system that, like I said, restricts what you, like, can restrict certain types that you capture. Um, so yeah, so you can basically say, I don't want a, a user to pass a socket or a, an actor to my, to my framework, because I can't serialize that. Um, so, uh, OK, fine, I gave you the two pieces. You have these, these, these immutable things of data, containers of data, silo thing, uh, and you have, have these spore things, right? And the idea is that uh, you apply your, your function, your spore thing, to the, the, the silo of data, right? So maybe we can look at kind of how that, how that works out. Um, I want to show you. Um, an example of what would happen under the covers if somebody else has kind of made a little distributed list application on top of this. So basically what they did was we assume for now that somebody implemented um, a map method or a map, a map operation and a reduce operation. Uh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, um, these things are actually uh, implemented as spores, and I'll, you'll see why. Um, but uh, this, is, uh, this is because we end up, like I said, passing them around, right? Um, so assuming that these things are implemented for us, and assuming that what we want to do is something very, like I said, distributed list, like where you have a, a little sh shards of a list all over on different machines, and I, I want to do like a map on all of the pieces and then kind of keep track of what the whole distributed thing is, and then maybe do another map and then a reduce or something, okay? So let's say that's what we want to do. Let's kind of look at a cute little illustration of sort of what this would look like under the covers. Um, so you start out on the machine 
with the local computation that actually kicks off all the computation, right? Uh, and you start off with the silo ref of your original piece of data. So let's just say that our original piece of data is a list of int, right? So like I would have, in, in this case, I would read this from some persistent store somewhere um, that I can always just like reread it if I ever need it again. Um, and I would basically start by calling apply and passing the, the map function and what I, whoops, and what, and, and the, so basically the map function and then the user passed function, this thing called f here. So that would be basically the function that somebody would pass to, a, to a, the map higher order function, right? And um, what happens is, okay, a new, a new silo ref gets created. Um, and the new silo ref contains all of the little pieces that it needs to uh, evaluate whatever this silo is on another machine, wherever it is. So I have everything I need to actually get that result uh, remotely somewhere else, uh, associated with the silo ref that points to it. So, uh, and I also have a reference to the piece of data that I came from, so the silo ref that I came from. So let's just say I want to do that map, another map, and then a reduce, because why not? It would all happen in the same way. So you call the apply method, and that one is the, the, the lazy one. So what I'm doing is I'm not actually sending anything anywhere. I'm just kind of building a little computation graph. Uh, and then when I deem ready to kick off this computation, I will do a force. So let's just say that, well, because I want an actual result back from the reduce, maybe it's, you know, in this case, since it's a, I'm doing a reduce on a list of integers, it's just one int. Sure, I want that back. Send it over the wire, send it back to me. Uh, at the, re at the, at the, at the, silo, the silo ref that represents the reduce, the one all the way to the right here, uh, is where I would do this send thing. So that, that, that makes, that basically uh, collects all of the stuff, all the pieces that I need uh, to do this computation. And the idea is that it would then send it over the wire and kick that off, right? So this is what things would look like. Um, that original silo ref would point to an actual piece of data somewhere. Uh, of course, it's a silo of list of int. And then when uh, this send thing actually gets, gets uh, invoked, this is when, like I said, all of the, the functions and the pieces get sent to the runtime that manages this silo. Okay? So you would send your function, all, all, the, all, of, all of the functions, or either, either all of the functions or you could also do some sort of function composition to get rid of intermediate data structures like you would do with a view. You have a choice as the, the framework builder to, to, to do these things. Um, whoops. And this is basically what would happen. Everything would then start evaluating, and then uh, and the, you end up with the same structure. Uh, you end up with a bunch of these silo things um, which contain references to the, the piece of data that they came from. So um, what you end up having, whoops, sorry. Oh, that, that happened too quickly. Um, the silo thing on the very right here, the silo of int, represents, as you can see, the reduce operator. Uh, and when that finishes its operation, this would then return, uh, return it, its result back to, back to the silo ref that requested it. Uh, and it completes that future that I showed you earlier. So uh, the, send, uh, the send method uh, has type future of t, where in this case it's future of int, and it gets completed with the result of, of the reduce. So um, you might ask then how, uh, how exactly does that help fault tolerance? Well, if you look at this again, um, this whole thing, whoops, let's keep doing that, yeah. If you look at this whole thing, um, it's, it's, you can actually imagine, this is a, a very simple case, this can easily branch out, like I could, take this intermediate map where you apply the f to it and, and uh, maybe do a reduce there. Or I can make basically a tree-like data structure that represents all of the different sort of computations that I do with intermediate results. Um, and you know, this, this structure would be replicated on both, on both sides, basically, because you wind up with the same structure and all the functionality required uh, on both sides to basically run the, the whatever the map function plus the user defined map uh, the user supplied uh, function parameter that you would give to the map you have all of that so actually what you end up having is this persistent data structure uh, that you build up Oops. and and so um, 
if you want your system to be fault tolerant, which means if something crashes or fails, you want to be able to restart something and be able to rebuild uh, what you lost, uh, it's, it's pretty easy, actually, given the, the structure and the way things are, 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 are built up, uh, to reconstruct uh, one of these silos, because these silos and these silo refs relate to each other uh, like I said, via this persistent data structure, you have like all, you know, you have this tree-like structure. And um, if, in, like I said, you have all of the, the, the operations that you need to derive the data that you are looking for as your result. So to figure out how to uh, recompute what you had just lost, all you have to do is traverse your little data structure to complete uh, your lineage, which is basically the, the history or, or all of the operations that you ended up doing on your, on your original piece of persistent data. And since this whole lineage thing is composed of spores, uh, it can be serialized. Uh, so you can either write this to disk, you can, uh, you know, if you have two machines running sort of like, like identical shards, or, or sorry, identical jobs on, on different data shards, uh, you could just maybe have one machine, you know, pass to his neighbor the lineage that he was working on, right? And then uh, you could restart computation that way. So uh, just by design, it's pretty simple to, to, re to restart jobs. Um, so uh, to sort of summarize the, these, this, this data, whatever, this data container silo plus spores model that I call right now function passing, um, all of these operate like all of this is, is is managed using a persistent data structure, and all of the operations, including uh, those provided by the framework builders, uh, are are these are spores. So that means that they they can be serialized, uh, and they can be you know like I said persisted and used as some sort of uh, point to re or rather some sort of uh, functionality to rerun. Uh, and as a result of that, like these two things together, make it a little bit easier to 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 you know recover from, from uh, a failure somewhere, uh, because you don't have to, to try and recreate some, some state that you've saved somewhere else. Um, and maybe uh, someone might, you might ask, OK, well, uh, if, I, if I have some way to send messages and I have these four things, it seems like sort of uh, the, the, what, what you get from this whole, this whole model is, is the ability to, like I said, send this functionality around. So if you're just smart with it, um, you know, couldn't you just send spores between different actors, or, or, or not even actors, but whatever, two different processes? And that's, and I, I, I agree that you, you, you can. That's pretty powerful already. But uh, the way that this model is, is built, um, because it's, you have this, this persistent data structure, and you, know, uh, you don't have to worry about state getting all messed up, uh, you get a lot more extra sort of benefits out of the box. So the one thing is that this uh, statelessness in these lineages, uh, so, you know, to simplify uh, like recovering from failures. But also uh, one thing I didn't really cover in detail is 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 uh, this deferred evaluation. So like this laziness idea. So the idea that you can kind of do like a distributed view. So if you go back to this example, oh wait, yeah, I shouldn't do this because it's going to do the whole thing again. Um, if you if you go back here. Uh, you, and let's just say that each, each of these three pieces of, 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 of uh, resulting sort of data, these, uh, the result, the, the three new silo things that you end up with, um, you know, like maybe since they represent each maps, you could imagine that uh, I would compose the two functions that represent these two intermediate silos, right? So then I could get rid of an intermediate data structure because why traverse the whole data set twice? You can do things like this because, you know, with the, the apply uh, sort of send uh, methods, it's up to the, the, the person who winds up uh, building the, the framework. Um, yep. And, and so that, that's sort of like the, the idea behind this. Um, right now, we're just experimenting with it. Uh, if you think that you have some situation or use case that it couldn't handle, uh, let us know uh, because it's it's right now it's a it's an exercise we're 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 trying to push it and see see how far we can we can take it how how annoying it gets to actually implement a, a, an interesting system on top of it which is why sort of I'm playing with it uh, in the Spark project uh, so if you have any thoughts or if you want to 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 you know like like let me know <laughs> that you have some some impossible thing that it can't can't uh, cover please tell me I'd love to hear it so. Uh, 
that, that's it. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, so, sure, I guess in the front. Uh, do you have any examples of what you've been able to do with this? Uh, so right now I'm just trying to, right now, so I'm just building basically, I have two sort of applications that I've been playing with, and one is like trying to build some Spark-like framework on top of it, or to insert it into Spark to see all the places that it breaks or how annoying it gets. And then another thing is to try and do some sort of streaming application. So streaming in that, you know, you have small enough sort of batches, small kind of like silo things that collect like, you know, small pieces of data, and then you keep track of, well, yeah, I mean, a streaming application <laughs> with small pieces of, of, of silo data. Um, Uh, so, so no. So, um, so the question was, how do you actually serialize the code? Uh, so in Scala, when you compile uh, an anonymous function, you, I'm sorry, or, or a function literal or any sort of function, you wind up with a synthesized class. So you actually have a class that represents that function. The problem is the, the thing that that spores solve uh, is that you know this thing can you know reference anything. It can have mutable. Uh, reference, like you can have vars inside of it that you can reassign. Uh, you can do all kinds of things inside of this in, inside of this function that just basically break all the time during you know at, at runtime. So it's actually it's actually a big problem for Spark. Um, they, a lot of people regularly run into issues with it. It's a very popular question on their mailing list, and they have a, a special byte, clo a byte code cleaning tool that clears out any sort of outer references to any other objects so that, like, even if you wanted to logically reference something over, you know, in somewhere other place, it just gets nulled out. So you have to figure that out yourself. Um, so it's actually a, a real problem that they, they, them, they, they, they face. Uh, Dean? Uh, so, so a, a, I mean, a silo is just a piece of data, and it's the same as if you do a reduction, like on a list. So you actually, like, you actually implement that in, in the, the function that you pass to it, right? So I have, a, I have the type, I have a list, and then I call reduce on it. I know that I can, can call reduce on a list, and I have the function that you want to pass to that reduce. So it's all the same as normal. What if, it's, if you've got several silos that you need to reduce over? several silos that you need to reduce over it. So then you need to have some sort of reduction tree that you build up, right? And that's, that's something that you build, and then the communication sort of of the, like, so, so you build yourself, you figure out yourself as the framework builder. Like I said, I didn't really show you how, how to build a, the, the logic that you would, like, as somebody who wanted to build, like, a Spark-like abstraction. I didn't give you, like, that implementation, the, the map or the reduce. Um, but the idea is that in those functions that, all you would be doing really is the communication. So you would be figuring out the hierarchy of things like on some machine, on the machine that does, the, 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 the master machine that dispatches all of the jobs. Uh, you would figure out sort of like the hierarchy of all of the other machines and then you would figure out, um, you know, who does what. And then what you actually send to it is, is calls to local classes uh, to actually do that reduce locally. And then, you know, aggregating all of the futures that you wind up getting back is something that you, as I said, the, the framework builder, implement yourself. You just make sure that what you pass is just a, a, a spore to each individual machine that represents the logic to be calling on that individual node. If that's clear, I hope that's clear. Uh, okay, um, I guess you. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. So they're serializable. Uh, I, I actually, I, I don't see why you couldn't. I don't know what horrible thing could happen if one of your users had somehow a reference to one of your distributed pieces of data. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't thought about it, but I, right now I don't see any restriction against it. Yep. Uh, how does this differ from the implementation of Spark argument? Uh, so Spark actually does, so this is, this, this is basically, um, so the question, sorry, to repeat the question, how does this differ from, from Spark RDDs? Uh, so this is basically just like a little message passing thing where we're passing functions. It's just a little uh, way to move data, I'm sorry, functions to data. It, Spark does 10 zillion more things. It also doesn't do things internally in a very well-typed way. Um, everything inside of Spark is any. 
So it's actually kind of hard to figure out what's even happening when there are errors inside. Um, and so really the, the, what this is is a, a super like lightweight idea uh, that sort of, in, like, sort of represents the, the basic sort of functioning of what Spark does, which is it has mutable data, it applies a function, gets a new piece of mutable data, and then, you know, same lineage idea where you can re recover. It, it does all that, but in a lightweight way uh, where you don't have to actually have some huge distributed data set. You can do anything you want with it. I can coordinate between two different data stores. I don't have to have a distributed collections abstraction built on top of it. It's like something that somebody else can pick up and sort of uh, benefit from some of the sort of same good design decisions that Matei made when he, when he designed Spark in the first place. Uh, yep. Oh, you mentioned the system of fault tower because you have data that stores everywhere. Mm -hmm. So how, like, how, what do you mean? How do you know when a node crashes? No, you know the nodes crash. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know the nodes take over. How do you synchronize the nodes? So, presumably so if you know a node crashed, um, you know, it's, so it's up to you to duplicate these lineages. If you don't, uh, then, and you have one node, then you're, you lose your one node and that's it. But the idea is that you should have, this should, if you are, you know, having multiple machines, you should have this lineage replicated. You can ask a neighbor, you can save it to disk, and you can look it up again and reuse it and restart the whole thing. So you should have some persistent store, like, a, like something that you read from S3, or some piece of data that you know how to get at again, uh, and then you have your, all the, the, the operations that you've called on that data, and you can just replay them. Is that the question that you asked? Okay, cool. Yep. Mm -hmm. Like if I like maybe I could have composed them or something. Um, because I, it, it's actually for the sake of abstraction. Um, because right now, like I said, the use cases that I'm focusing on that sort of really fit this model really well are situations where you have a bunch of data and uh, you're trying to basically coordinate a bunch of machines and do some kind of batch processing or uh, streaming thing. Um, and in order to abstract over this thing, uh, it's, it's really hard to insert your own functionality that doesn't have state. How do I, how do I like, implement the map without state? Uh, and the way to do that is to have some function that represents like, whatever functionality you're trying to actually implement in your system uh, and we do it like in this, this spore way, so you're forced to write it in a stateless way. Uh, and and you know, then whatever the user passes to you, which also abides by the same restrictions. Yep. Yeah, so, see, you're talking about uh, like, uh, having the opportunity to do composition on the client side. And then, uh, but then on the server side, uh -huh. uh, when you run stuff, you may uh, want to do decomposition, right? So do like mapping here on some servers. On other servers. So, uh, how do you do it? Like, do you provide this information? Uh, this like uh, opportunity. It reminds me like modeling lambda in a pie count. So, oh. part of this stuff. And yeah. I, I, so, like the. Let me try to. You can correct me if I have your question wrong. Um, but you're asking. It's mostly about. Is it about like the laziness? Like reduce. Like having um, like this view thing where I can. On the on the on the well on the the local side on the side that sends the, the the command to do something to the data on that side I can like you know do like this this fusion or get rid of these intermediate data structures right and you're saying why can't you also have that ability on the data side right is that what you're asking? No, I was talking about rather like those functions. So uh, you said that you can do composition, right? Uh -huh. plus, uh, oh, okay. The yeah. Side, the Oh, to decompose. Uh, yeah, actually, I haven't thought about. I haven't thought about wanting to decompose. I don't know what situation where you would want to decompose. Uh, that's a good question. I haven't. I haven't deeply considered it. Like, uh, so 
I don't completely understand the question. I, I understand that you're, you're saying there's this one scenario where you have like you know supercompute intensive thing like one of these silo things with a bunch of data, and then you have other scenarios where you could have little pieces of data. But I don't. What, what do you mean exactly? Like like is there some intuition for performance trade-offs? Trade um, yeah, actually, like it kind of gets. It's very funny because it gets kind of more future-like or something as the data gets smaller. Right, uh, and then so you can have a lot more of these things, and then they can be doing all kinds of, you know, m more messaging or whatever, because that's like the thing that they're doing that's expensive. Um, or you could have the larger one that does, you know, like churning through some data set, and the latency is not as important. Um, I, I don't, I don't have much to say, but you know, that's a, like a decision of the application, or rather the framework developer, uh, to try and, and sort of optimize those two things. But the whole point is that like they have the ability to decide how big their data is that they store in these little things. So if you have lots of little small pieces of data, perhaps try not to communicate too much. If you have a big piece of data, who cares how much you communicate? Just get the job done, I guess. And that would be who, who builds the framework, I guess. Yep. Um, is there any like security mechanism for preventing code from having side effects or like nope. using too much memory or Nope. Like no. Um, so I don't I don't prevent side effects at all. Like we don't have any way to do that. So there's nothing I can really do. However, side effecting like I, I, I alluded to is good sometimes. Like I need to log. Maybe, you know? Um, so yeah, it would be nice to have things be completely fully pure, but there are practical reasons, especially in a distributed system, that you do kind of want some sort of side effecting operation. If you have a thing that actually has to run, then logging is good, exceptions could be good, you know? Um, so I don't stop those because they're practical. And I can't anyway. <laughs> Sure, yeah, like one that represents each transformation that happened. Yep. No, that, that's a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, actually, I'm three minutes over time, so if there's any other questions, I can take them. Otherwise, I think that's it.